American Revolution, also called United States War of Independence or American Revolutionary War, 1775-83, insurrection by which 13 of Great Britain's North American colonies won political independence and went on to form the United States of America. The war followed more than a decade of growing estrangement between the British crown and a large and influential segment of its North American colonies that was caused by British attempts to assert greater control over colonial affairs after having long adhered to a policy of salutary neglect. Until early in 1778, the conflict was a civil war within the British Empire, but afterward it became an international war as France in 1778 and Spain, in 1779 joined the colonies against Britain. Meanwhile, the Netherlands, which provided both official recognition of the United States and financial support for it, was engaged in its own war against Britain. From the beginning, sea power was vital in determining the course of the war, lending to British strategy a flexibility that helped compensate for the comparatively small numbers of troops sent to America and ultimately enabling the French to help bring about the final British surrender at Yorktown. Land Campaigns to 1778 Americans fought the war on land with essentially two types of organization, the Continental National Army and the state militias. The total number of the former provided by quotas from the states throughout the conflict was 231,771 men, and the militias totaled 164,087. At any given time, however, the American forces seldom numbered over 20,000. In 1781, there were only about 29,000 insurgents under arms throughout the country. The war was therefore one fought by small field armies. Militias, poorly disciplined, and with elected officers, were summoned for periods usually not exceeding three months. The terms of Continental Army service were only gradually increased from one to three years, and not even bounties and the offer of land kept the army up to strength. Reasons for the difficulty in maintaining an adequate continental force included the colonists' traditional antipathy toward regular armies, the objections of farmers to being away from their fields, the competition of the states with the Continental Congress to keep men in the militia, and the wretched and uncertain pay in a period of inflation. By contrast, the British Army was a reliable, steady force of professionals. Since it numbered only about 42,000, heavy recruiting programs were introduced. Many of the enlisted men were farm boys, as were most of the Americans. Others were unemployed persons from the urban slums. Still others joined the army to escape fines or imprisonment. The great majority became efficient soldiers as a result of sound training and ferocious discipline. The officers were drawn largely from the gentry and the aristocracy and obtained their commissions and promotions by purchase. Though they received no formal training, they were not so dependent on a book knowledge of military tactics as were many of the Americans. British generals, however, tended toward a lack of imagination and initiative, while those who demonstrated such qualities often were rash. Because troops were few and conscription unknown, the British government, following a traditional policy, purchased about 30,000 troops from various German princes. The Lensgrave Landgrave, of Hesse furnished approximately three-fifths of that total. Few acts by the Crown roused so much antagonism in America as that use of foreign mercenaries. Prelude to war. The colony of Massachusetts was seen by King George Ida and his ministers as the hotbed of disloyalty. After the Boston Tea Party, December 16, 1773, Parliament responded with the Intolerable Acts, 1774, a series of punitive measures that were intended to cow the restive population into obedience. The 1691 Charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony was abrogated, and the colony's elected ruling council was replaced with a military government under Gen. Thomas Gage, the commander of all British troops in North America. At Gage's headquarters in Boston, he had four regiments, perhaps 4,000 men, under his command, and Parliament deemed that force sufficient to overawe the population in his vicinity. William Legg, 2nd Earl of Dartmouth, Secretary of State for the Colonies, advised Gage that the violence committed by those who have taken up arms in Massachusetts have appeared to me as the acts of a rude rabble, without plan, without concert, without conduct. From London, Dartmouth concluded that a small force now, if put to the test, would be able to conquer them, with greater probability of success, than might be expected of a larger army, if the people should be suffered to form themselves upon a more regular plan. Gage, for his part, felt that no fewer than 20,000 troops would be adequate for such an endeavor, but he acted with the forces he had at hand. Beginning in the late summer of 1774, 
Gage attempted to suppress the warlike preparations throughout New England by seizing stores of weapons and powder. Although the colonials were initially taken by surprise, they soon mobilized. Groups such as the Sons of Liberty uncovered advanced details of British actions, and committees of correspondence aided in the organization of countermeasures. Learning of a British plan to secure the weapons cache at Fort William and Mary, an undermanned army outpost in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Boston's Committee of Correspondence dispatched Paul Revere on December 13, 1774, to issue a warning to local allies. The following day, several hundred men assembled and stormed the fort, capturing the six-man garrison, seizing a significant quantity of powder, and striking the British colors. A subsequent party removed the remaining cannons and small arms. That act of open violence against the Crown infuriated British officials, but their attempts to deprive the incipient rebellion of vital war material over the following months were increasingly frustrated by colonial leaders who denuded British supply catches and sequestered arms and ammunition in private homes. On April 14, 1775, Gage received a letter from Dartmouth informing him that Massachusetts had been declared to be in a state of open revolt and ordering him to arrest and imprison the principal actors and abettors in the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. Gage had received his orders, but the colonials were well aware of his intentions before he could act. Paul Revere's Ride and the Battles of Lexington and Concord on April 16, Revere rode to Concord, a town 20 miles, 32 kilometers, northwest of Boston, to advise local compatriots to secure their military stores in advance of British troop movements. Two nights later, Revere rode from Charlestown, where he confirmed that the local Sons of Liberty had seen the two lanterns that were posted in Boston's Old North Church, signaling a British approach across the Charles River, to Lexington to warn that the British were on the march. Revolutionary leaders John Hancock and Samuel Adams fled Lexington to safety, and Revere was joined by fellow writers William Dawes and Samuel Prescott. The trio were apprehended outside Lexington by a British patrol, but Prescott escaped custody and was able to continue on to Concord. Revere's midnight ride provided the colonists with vital information about British intentions, and it was later immortalized in a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Some 700 British troops spent the evening of April 18, 1775, forming ranks on Boston Common, with orders to seize the colonial armory at Concord. The lengthy public display ensured that Gage had lost any chance at secrecy, and by the time the force had been transported across the Charles River to Cambridge, it was 2 o'clock a.m. the following morning. The march to Lexington was an exercise in misery. It began in a swamp and the British were forced to wade through brackish water that was, in places, waist-deep. By the time the soaked infantrymen arrived in Lexington at approximately 5 o'clock a.m., 77 Minutemen were among those who had assembled on the village green. Officers on both sides ordered their men to hold their positions but not to fire their weapons. It is unclear who fired the shot heard round the world, but it sparked a skirmish that left eight Americans dead. The colonial force evaporated, and the British moved on to Concord, where they were met with determined resistance from hundreds of militiamen. Now outnumbered and running low on ammunition, the British column was forced to retire to Boston. On the return march, American snipers took a deadly toll on the British, and only the timely arrival of 1,100 reinforcements prevented the retreat from becoming a rout. Those killed and wounded at the battles of Lexington and Concord numbered 273 British and 95 Americans. The Siege of Boston and the Battle of Bunker Hill. Rebel militia then converged on Boston from all over New England, while London attempted to formulate a response. General Sir William Howe, Sir Henry Clinton, and John Burgoyne were dispatched at once with reinforcements, and Charles Cornwallis followed later. Those four commanders would be identified with the conduct of the principal British operations. The Continental Congress in Philadelphia, acting for the 13 colonies, voted for general defensive measures, called out troops, and appointed George Washington a Virginia commander-in-chief. Before Washington could take charge of the 15,000 colonial troops laying siege to the British garrison in Boston, Gage ordered Howe to drive the Americans from the heights in Charlestown. The Americans provoked the assault by entrenching on Breed's Hill, the lower of two hills overlooking the British position. The placement of American artillery on the heights would have made the British position in Boston untenable, so on June 17, 1775, Howe led a British frontal assault on the American fortifications. In the misleadingly named Battle of Bunker Hill, Breed's Hill was the primary locus of combat. 
Howe's 2,300 troops encountered withering fire while storming the rebel lines. The British eventually cleared the hill, but at the cost of more than 40% of the assault force, and the battle was a moral victory for the Americans.